Hello and welcome again to Chair Red TV. I'm Ian McNay and my guest today is Attila the Stockbroker. Hi Attila. Good morning. Nice to see you again. It's been a long time. It has actually. It's been a few years, yeah. And Attila has a, a, a good history with Chair Red. We first uh, signed him in 1982 and we did an album, Ranting at the Nation. We did Actually we did a, an EP first called Cocktails, then an album called uh, Ranting at the Nation. And uh, We've published very recently a book called Attila Stockbroker, Heart on My Sleeve, Collected Works 1980 to 2020, which is based on the lyrics of all his poems, many, many poems over the years. And he also has out in Chered an autobiography called Arguments Yard. And what I really liked about the cover, I should show the cover here, is the T-shirt that Attila was wearing, which says, most people ignore most poetry because most poetry ignores most people which is probably a very uh, a very deep statement because it's probably absolutely true it is true it's, it's a part of the, the, the quote is from adrian mitchell one of the great 60s poets um who you may well have heard of who's very well known in within the sort of counter counterculture of the 1960s 70s and 80s um and it is absolutely true and it's the whole basis on which my entire ethos has has been since I started, which is that I aim to take poetry to places that it doesn't normally go. I discovered I had this talent for writing words that rhymed and and rhythmed that I inherited from my dad, who was a who was a good amateur poet himself. And I decided to take that well, basically more or less straight into the punk rock scene in the, in the late seventies, early eighties. And I've earned my living now for forty one years as a till of the stockbroker. Yeah. So you know, um, and this this kind of reformation with Cherry Red, which of course, as you rightly say, we did an EP uh, and, and my first album, and indeed the sister label Anagram did my second album, Sawdust and Empire. Yes. And then, and then we went out, uh, and then we did, and we did another EP as well, the Radio Rap and the Livingston Rap yeah. under the name of, uh, that was uh, under Red, the name of the Law Lord Lords. Red Kem, was Cherry it? Red Ken, the Law Lord Lords yeah. International. That was me and my friend Steve Drew from the New Town New Rotten. And, and then we went our separate ways, but I've always kept in touch. We've always seen each other many times over the years. And it was lovely too when I asked if you were interested in doing my autobiography in 2015. I was very pleased you did. I'm really, really happy with how it's gone. Um, and uh, so therefore I asked if you'd like to do my collective works, which is logical. Yeah. I'm very much an, I'm, I'm, I'm like a tiny version of Cherry Red. I'm very much an auto producer. I'm a DIY performer. I put, I've put out all my own books and records, most of them for 35 years at least. Um, but I really wanted the sort of the big, moments i.e my collective works and my autobiography to come out on an established sort of yeah. publisher which and and i thought that was what a great idea to go back to cherry red so i'm really pleased that you've done that you welcomed me back with open arms and i think it's been a very successful collaboration absolutely so attila why don't we start with a short poem yeah look at the camera over there i'm, and give I'm us looking a short, over there my short. poetic license Sums it up, really. Yo, I'm the MC of Ranting Rebel Poetry, and I'm a history and my identity. I'm independent of Red Cottage Industry, DIY from here to eternity. Let me tell you what's been going on. I take inspiration from centuries long gone. Oral tradition of sedition. That's my position. No court jester with a tame disposition. Poetic license. 40 years I've had one. And they don't come easy. They're not handed out for fun. You have to earn it. Work and sweat and move. Not get stuck in a dead poet bore groove. I earn mine in dirty scummy punk clubs, art centres, rock gigs, festivals and dodgy pubs. And it's once or twice I've had to fight. Right. But when a fascist hits a poet, the poet's doing something right. I love words and I love them in the red and raw. I like to use them in ways I've not been used before. I want you to laugh, I want you to think as well. Bollocks to TV. This is live, as live as hell. Oral tradition. The real origins of poetry. Attila the stockbroker, ranting rebel MC, dean of the Social Surrealist University. Welcome to my wild poetic journey. Cheers. <laughs> The thing right. is that, of course, it's a lot more than that now, because when that sums up in many ways how I began. But obviously, I've been doing this for 40 years. Yeah, but tell us how you began, because you were inspired by punk, weren't you? To start yes, absolutely. With? Well, I mean, how I began really was, I mean, I started writing little poems when I was a little kid. And I did my first ever performance when I was nine at Manor Hall Primary School in uh, South West Sussex, where I'm from and where I live, uh, reciting uh, Belloc, Hilaire Belloc's uh, story of Jim, who ran away from his nurse and was eaten by a lion. Um, and then another one, Matilda, who told lies and was burned to death. This is all from the cautionary tales of Hilaire Belloc, who was a, a great sort of Victorian rhymester polemicist, um, with whom I have a lot in common, I must say, yeah. apart from the fact we both come from Sussex. Um, and uh, it just went on from there, really. I've always, I was always writing little poems and songs. Uh, 
one time time I was about 14, 15, when I was into T-Rex and the Velvets um, and, uh, and what the hoop and all that sort of stuff, I was starting to think I wouldn't make my living as a, as a musician. And I was always thinking, like most people of that sort of age were, that I wanted to be in a band. And I started getting into bands a bit before punk. Then punk happened. I was in bands. The bands kept splitting and your up. Your first band was called Brighton Riot Squad. Right, but it was indeed and, called Brighton Riot Squad. And you did a gig. One we gig. Did one, we did one gig <laughs> and it wasn't very good. But it was very, very soon was obvious to me that the, my main strength was writing words. I was the bass player in bands and that wasn't a good place to, to be singing from. Um, and so I started jumping up on stage in between bands, shouting my poems. And it went really well almost immediately. I was very soon, um, basically to cut a very long story short, one of the pioneers of Rock Against Racism indeed, Red Saunders, uh, did an EP by myself and my long lamented comrades Stephen Seething Wells called Rough Raw and Ranting on his own in Sainsbury's record label. That got played on Peel quite a lot. Mr Mike Allway at the time scouting for, for the Cherry Red Records heard that and uh, decided to ask me if I would like to join the team as it were, well, I was probably on the subs bench, but uh, nevertheless, I joined the team. I did my first album, Ranting at the Nation, and my first EP. They both went well, um, and it launched yeah, but me. Let's, let's not jump too far ahead, because I always, I always think the formative years are interesting of, of, uh, of people. And uh, so you did, your, you did your first gig as Brighton, Brighton Riot squad, squad, and then you got involved with a venue called The Vault. Um, in Brighton, That's I right. think you were promoting and helping to organise, and a lot of great bands came out of, of Brighton. Piranhas, yeah. Peter and Test You, Babies, yeah, yeah. Um, Nicky and the Dots, Job and the Hooligans, Depressions, um, Smeggy and the Cheesy Bitch, who became King Kurt. Yeah, um, there were loads and loads, um, and, and the vault itself was really was a fascinating place because what it was, well, I mean, there was the Presbyterian Church Hall uh, above, which was an old, obviously an old church hall, which was given over to the local punks and squatters for for the, for the whole sort of scene. And underneath it was this burial vault. And it was decided by the council that the punks would be allowed to use it as their gig venue and rehearsal space. And a sort of, a sort of, well, basically cardboard division was put at the back, slightly more than cardboard, but not much, between the bit we were going to use for playing gigs and rehearsing in and the hundreds hundreds of feet anyway of catacombs which went right under Brighton of so this uh, was dead, dead, 19th, real dead. 19th century um, bodies many of really? them it transpires Huguenot plague victims because what happened was very soon the um, basically the vibrations and everything and, and people getting drunk and kicking it meant that the the, the wall collapsed and these st this stuff so these bodies and coffins and things started coming through the wall and I remember going I remember one vivid memory of going to the vault one night when I was supposed to be doing the door for a gig and in the middle of the floor was a little baby's lead coffin with the bones still in it and I picked it up and I thought I need something to take the, take the money in for tonight's gig. So I moved the bones to one end and used the other end as a cash box. Now, I mean, if you like, that was... That sounds terrible. It was prototype death metal, really. Yeah. And of course, very soon, after, very soon after that, the, the council uh, realised that something really not very, very sort of all right was happening and the place got closed down. But it was, uh, it was a, certainly an interesting time in the Brighton scene, which many of the kind of people my age will remember. And the vault was an extraordinary place, both in terms of the atmosphere created by this subterranean sort of environment and by the fact that you know we were literally feet away from you know a hundred years of, of, of dead Brighton yeah yeah and there was a couple of albums that came out on Atrix Records compilations of 1478 1479 yeah of the of the Lunch local bands Peel. yeah um the Nicky and the Dots uh Joby and the Hooligans uh the Piranhas uh the Dodgems the Lilettes T um, Test Tubes were on there I think the Test Tube Babies yeah. first very first track they were 15 Elvis is dead. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was a very. I mean, the Brighton scene was very was a very positive scene. It was a very. There was a lot of talented bands there, um, and this is sort of seventy seven, seventy eight. Yeah. Um, and then I went to Belgium, and when I because I was at Kent University at the time as well, and I was organising Rock Against Racism, uh, Kent area. I was doing a lot of stuff with Rock Against Racism, um, and I went and also I was also on the entertainments committee at university, which gave me an early grounding in how to organise gigs. So I was I learned how to promote gigs. What I actually basically, I studied French politics at university, but what I learned was how to put on gigs, how to organise sort of, you know, political demonstrations and stuff like that. And, uh, and, and it was the beginnings of my, my activities as a poet musician as well. So I went to Belgium, was involved with a band called Contingent on bass, really good band. Um, and that inspired, uh, that whole story was a mad story in 1979 when the Belgian or Brussels authorities decided to ban live rock music in Brussels after there was a, Mostly there was a free Peter Tosh gig 
uh, put on by the by the city council. Everyone was smoking dope. The police in Belgium at that time were not keen on marijuana smoking. So they basically started beating everybody up. There was a riot. And the mayor, Van Alteren, decided as a result that he was going to try and ban live rock music, which, of course, not, not a very sensible thing to do because uh, it wasn't going to work. Um, but it ended up with a great big riot in the town centre that we were all involved in. And then I came back to England in 1980, got a job as a clerk translator in a stockbroking company. As a, It was like I'd registered as a translator because I speak French and German. Um, and uh, I got this job, which I always knew was going to be a very temporary job. But it, one day someone said I had the manners of Attila the Hun. And I thought, Attila the stockbroker, that's a good stage name. And just about that time, I was getting up on the stage performing beginnings of my, of my, you know, beginnings of my idea as a performance poet. So I called myself a Tiller the Stockbroker and simply calling myself that, that on its own, regardless of anything else, just being called a Tiller the Stockbroker got me 20 of my earliest gigs and my one and only manager who had oh, no idea. We were talking about your manager, yeah. Ray Santilli. Ray yeah. Santilli. He was a legend, wasn't my he? My one and only manager, who, who became my manager purely and simply on the basis of my name, had absolutely no idea of what I did, but thought, if he's called Attila the stockbroker, it's got to be interesting. So he got me a gig at Dingwalls. He invited all the A&R people to come along. And what they saw was this bloke uh, shouting poetry, uh, some of which was OK, some of which wasn't very good, thrashing a mandolin, and doing a song about a dead cat, which involved throwing maggots into the audience. Um, and of course, needless to say, they all walked out because it was only about my sixth gig and I really wasn't very good at all. But the thing about Race and Tilly was that many, many years later, when I was writing, indeed, the autobiography, um, I just thought, well, I'll look him up in Google. And what I found was Race and Tilly was the guy behind the alien autopsy scam. That's right. Um, which um, he, he was trying to persuade people that he got this load of guts together and was trying to persuade people that it was a it was a, an autopsy of, a, of an alien which had come down in Ros, Roswell or somewhere in America. Uh, and, and what was really funny about that was that it was a similar approach to trying to persuade A and R people to employ um, a young bloke shouting mainly rude political poetry thrashing a mandolin and singing a song about a dead cat, which involved throwing maggots into the audience. Uh, in other words, yeah. not something you'd expect and not something that you would expect many people to take seriously. More people took the Roswell thing seriously than they took me, but I got yeah. better very quickly. 3rd of July, 1946. So that you know about this stuff. I know about Roswell, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's, it's legendary. But the thing that you've missed out about Ray Santilli that was really important, which could have launched your career properly, was that he produced the birdie song by the tweets, didn't he? I what, didn't know that. What a great fit, a tiller stockbroker and the birdie song by the tweets. I didn't, you, you didn't, I didn't know, know that, I didn't really. Know that. I didn't he, know he that. He produced that album. I didn't know that. Yeah, that, that big is, hit single. That, I didn't realise that among his many other talents, he was also Yeah, if you listen to him more, producer. you never know what might have happened to you. <laughs> but I've had a big hit single. Well, I mean, yeah, you know, I, I, well, I did get to number, you, you may, you probably, I did get to number 17 in the charts, uh, do you know? Do you, that was, you the song, was the Brighton song. The Brighton song. Yeah. yeah. We, Tom Hart. We then, let's not jump too no, far okay, ahead because yeah, sure. let's have yeah, a degree yeah. of sequence here. So anyway, um, what we haven't covered is how did you actually start writing poems? You said to me earlier before we started recording, your dad actually was a bit of a poet. So were you writing poems when you were really young? Really young. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's funny because my father, my father has amazing family history. My father was born in 1899. He was 59 when I was born. He yes. fought in the First World War. He was incredibly influenced by Wilfred Owen and Seaford Sassoon. He he was the only member of his battalion to survive in 1918 uh, at a German attack. And the reason he survived was because he got Spanish flu and he was in the hospital and the rest of them were wiped out. And it had obviously he had saw horrible things, and uh, and he was a he was a really good, talented, natural versifier. Most of what he wrote was was humorous stuff. I mean, he was published quite a lot in this in the Second World War in the Home Guard magazine, um, and he wrote lovely love poems for my mother. But most of what he wrote was throwaway sort of humorous stuff. But that intrinsic kind of ability to rhyme is something that I discovered that I had when I was really little. And because yeah. he was retired by then, as say he was fifty nine when I was born, he was retired when I was growing up. He died when I was ten. He encouraged me to write poetry when I was a really little kid. And I, I can still remember the first one of the first ones I wrote 
Mrs. Fry had a fright in the middle of the night. She saw a ghost eating toast halfway up her bedpost. And underneath I put, Mrs. Fry has such a fat tummy. And Mrs. Fry was one of my mum's friends. And Mrs. Fry <laughs> saw the poem. I wasn't terribly happy about it. And, and, uh, and how old were you then? Oh, for five. Really? Yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, by the time I was 10, by the time I was 8, 9, 10, I was writing lots of lots of stuff. And then uh, I had the misfortune to be incredibly clever and do very, very well. I did my 11 plus a year early. I won a scholarship to a horrible medieval transvestite institution in West Sussex. And the creativity was put on hold because at that place, they thought the way to learn poetry was to teach you it by rote. And I was nowhere everyone was going to do that. So I went into complete rebellion for about six years. When I came out, I was absolutely ready. I went to university when I was 17 just before the start of punk, got really involved in the, in the punk scene while I was at uni, also involved in the local scene in Brighton, where I'm from. Near where, you know, where I'm from. Um, but by 1980, I was very, very clear that I was going to be a poet. I mean, the Clash inspired me too, obviously. I knew I was going to be a poet musician for a living, and I knew basically what I'd be doing was mainly so, performance poetry. Although I've since then, I mean, I've done loads of albums of music. I've done and my best album I've ever done is actually very recently, which is because I love early music as well. I've just done an album of early music meets punk uh, about the uh, English Revolution of 1649 um, and the the levellers, diggers, and the ranters. And, and so, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, I do lots of other stuff too. I mean, I'm do a lot yeah, of writing, just, of journalism. Just, just sequentially, just to, to run, through, run through your career at that time. So when you started, obviously there was John Cooper Clark. Yeah, who indeed. Was, and, and then you got friendly with Seething Wells. Absolutely. And yeah. you were actually on a bill together, I think the three of you at one time, weren't you? Oh, yeah. I mean, Clark uh, and me and Swells performed together quite a few times. Yeah, the, the Rainbow, actually. Uh, yeah, we did the Rainbow. Yeah. We, did, uh, we also did, uh, we did um, uh, the Roxy. Uh, the Ritz, sorry, the Ritz in Manchester yes, together. Yeah. Uh, quite a few quite a few other places too. Um, and yeah, by 1982, I was on the front cover of Melody Maker. I'd got to do with Cherry Red. And uh, and I was kind of, you know, in my own way, um, a little bit of a sort of, and, and obviously the Peel stuff. Peel was so important because at that time, you know, it's, you can never, anybody watching this now from out of, who, who's sort of, 40 years younger than us, won't, won't appreciate this. Yeah. But the amazing thing about those John Peel shows was not only were there literally over a million people listening to it, but those million people were exactly the kind of people who may well be interested in what you were doing. There's no equivalent of that now. I mean, like Six Music, yeah. the Max say, is about one fiftieth or no, one hundredth of that in terms of the influence. I can still remember, Ian, when I did, my, I, I did a gig at Ips, um, in Ipswich to about 30 people. And the next night I had a gig in Aldershot. And the evening of the Ipswich gig, my first John Peel session came out. And the next night I played in West, Cent- West End Centre in Aldershot and it was sold out in advance. That is how much of an impact Yeah, it but you see, the, the interesting thing for me is that, and I don't know whether this was you really thinking it through, whether it all just happened, you had a real niche. You found a niche because for me, you, John Cooper Clark was more... I want to say gentlemanly, but that isn't quite the right word. But he was more softer in his, pro- his approach. You were really, as 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 you did the poem at the beginning of the program, you were really in people's face. Absolutely. So did you did you kind of was that something that you saw that no one else was doing, or was it something that just evolved naturally? It was just it was it was literally by chance. When I first started, it was just what I wanted to do. I had no. I then then when Red Saunders turned up at a gig with me and Swells and said. I want to record this and put it out on a single. I said, oh, sure, but who's going to buy poetry on a record? Um, so I'd heard John Cooper Clark by then, so I knew that it was possible. And then, to cut a long story short, he put it out, Peel played it a lot, and it all began. But it was always, I mean, everything that I've done throughout my whole life as a till of the stockbroker, and indeed before in a lot of ways, has been entirely on my own terms and literally doing what I want. I mean, because I then went, I mean, I went on having established a sort of a bit of a name for myself as a, as a ranting poet. I then did an album of, of, of kind of proto new folk, which, pre, which preceded people like the Pogues. And a lot of people went, what the hell is he doing? He's supposed to be a ranting poet. He's playing these, these weird medieval instruments and doing, and doing sort of acoustic stuff. That's what I wanted to do. And it, 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 it did okay. I mean, he put it out. It's, yeah. It sold enough to be all right. And then I did an album that was sort of proto electro rap. I did. I did one of the. I did one of the country's first ever twelve inch rap singles, radio rap, in nineteen eighty four. I mean, this was like wait, when when people like N.W.A. were like, you know, it was Brother D, Collective Effort, Africa Bombata, and obviously Grandmaster Flash. 
And I mean, I was into that as well. So I was doing rap before yeah. rap started, sort of new folk before new folk started, and invented early music meets punk like no one never done before. I mean, I've always been looking to do my own thing. You know, yeah. and it, the disadvantage of that is you can't be pigeonholed and people like to pigeonhole people. Um, but the advantage is that you're doing what you want. And, yeah. I, and I, that's, what I like, that's what I just what I do. I just always done it. It's very cherry red because a lot of the people on your label yeah. are very eclectic and do lots of different well, things at once. We love them. We love yeah. people like that. But just just to kind of just to kind of put it in sequence. So you had because I, I made a note of all this. You you had a tape release first of all on the No Wonder label, which was the run, label run by the Newtown Neurotics. That's right. Yeah. Called Phasing Out Capitalism. Yeah. Yeah. And then that helped you, from what I understand, get support with the jam, with seething, seething wells. It wasn't that. That wasn't. The, that wasn't. The, that wasn't the reason for the support with the jam. Okay. The support with the jam came about because Swells and I were doing a, a gig on the back of a lorry for the Right to Work campaign in London. Right. Michael Horowitz, who I'd got to know by that time, was one of the great pioneers of modern performance poetry. Was holding a a, a poetry event at the Young Vic, which featured. Um, Paul Weller, among others. So me and Swirls said, right, we're going to go along and see if we can get five minutes. So we gate crashed the gig, you know, with permission. We did five minutes each. It went down brilliantly. Paul Weller really liked it. So Paul Weller then asked me and Swirls to support the jam at Hammersmith Odeon. That's yeah. how that came about. Fantastic. And that's, that's, and that's what we always, that's what I've always done. I've always put myself out there. Yeah. Um, you probably can tell by now. You've probably always done this. I'm, I don't ha I mean, I don't have a, a lack of self-confidence gene. I have great self-belief. And I'm very extrovert and I just put myself out there. And if I believe I can do something, I have a go at it. I'm not always successful, but I always have a go. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I have a very open, you know, I mean, I'm very open. I organise a lot of stuff for other people as well. I'm always looking to help people. I'm the opposite of the kind of competitive performer who wants to keep people doing the same sort of thing, sort of under wraps. I encourage young performance poets I, I you know I, I, during lockdown I've been doing a thing called Attila the Stockbroker Introduces which is basically a weekly show where I put on sort of people that aren't particularly well known who I really like to reach a wider audience I mean I've always been I've, I've got a huge enthusiasm same way that you have for showcasing people for looking for new ideas and, yeah. I've, and this after 40 years you know same with you yeah. after more, well, a lot more than that's that that's what keeps me motivated and, and, and interested yeah. and so I know I'm banging on him, but I'm just doing the sequence here. So then you had your split seven-inch single with Seething Wells That's called right. Rough, Raw and Renting. And then you got, a, I thought it was a letter, but you got a note from Mike Orway, who was the then Trey Red a and person. I can still remember exactly what happened. I was, I, I Pale Peel played the first, that first single. He played a bang and a whimpy, Russians at the DHSS. Yeah. I don't talk to pop stars a lot. Yeah. And I got this... This, I got an envelope through the post, which was a bit lumpy, and I tore it open. It was a sort of corner of a, of a package or something. It was like a bit of cardboard, like a, you know, a corner out of one of those packets over there. Oh. And, and, and Michael Way put, put it's Mike, Michael Way from Cherry Red. Um, would you be interested in doing something with us? And then the phone number. So, of course, five minutes later, I phoned up. Yeah. And that was that. And I had the most wonderful time at Cherry Red, I've got to say. Um, I've said this to you before. I remember 53 Kensington Garden Square incredibly well. Yeah. Um, specifically, um, not just obviously, you know, I remember first thing is I signed and then I got taken into the sort of uh, the dispatch room and said, you know, any, any records you want, you can have. So, I, you know, I discovered lots we of We were far too generous, weren't we? Stuff. Um, then I, and the table tennis table was much used. And I remember playing table tennis with, among others, and other people, certainly people from Depeche Mode, not because they were on Cherry Road, because they were obviously at Mute, which is... Well, Mute was, was the floor on. below yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah, yeah. So that with Leibach, legendarily. Um, and of course, uh, the, the Gales, I, through Cherry Red, I became Mighty huge Gales. mates with, yeah. with Robert Lloyd, yeah. uh, who I'm still mates with today. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, Tracy, and Tracy Thorne, Ben Watt, Quentin Crisp. Um, no, Quentin know. Chris was never in, was never playing table tennis there. No, 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 he no. wasn't. No, he wasn't ever playing. But, the, the, but I mean, the, the one, the one that I was played, introduced to him a lot. Yeah, yeah the one so. that played a lot was Meatloaf because we were also part of recording studio Marcus Music. Right. So we went. Oh to yes, room, I remember that name. And, now, and, yeah. and, and, uh, and Meatloaf used to spend months making an album. We used to play yeah. table tennis. So it was a great, it was a great social well, see, gathering. I remember, there. I, I, Theo yeah. Chalmers and obviously yeah. Michael yeah. Way. Um, and you know, and yeah. it, was, it was great. It was really so, great. so you came in to see Mike, and yeah, Mike never liked to send out things on note paper. He always used to like mm. to improvise because he saw that as an all. He yeah. wasn't really a punk, but he saw it as an alternative approach. Well, I remember his his because uh, he, he was in a band called 
He was, he was in, in the band. He, no, I, he wasn't in the band. He managed them. He wrote the, I, he wrote I, the I songs. Don't, I don't want to work for British, British Airways. Airways. I yeah. love that song. I don't want to be a zombie. But he, he, he wasn't in it. He managed them. Yeah? Correct. What were they called but the he, Shapes? Were they called The Shapes? Uh, no, there was another band who was involved. We called The Shapes, yeah. And I, I remember Mike Orway, he, he, because what impressed me was a little bit like you, his enthusiasm. Yeah, and, sure. he, and he brought me this band called The Scissor Fits. And he says, you know, they're going to be bigger than the Beatles, Ian. And, it, you know, they obviously weren't. But on the other yeah, hand, yeah, yeah. I just loved his passion and yeah, belief. Sure, I get it. I get and it. that's absolutely. what you want. That's what we've always had at Cherry, this, yeah, this passion absolutely. and belief. Yeah. Well, I got that. I mean, it's, it was a perfect fit for me. Because you 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 had a very eclectic you know and I the I love the passage I mean Dick Whitson I got like a house of I used to do gigs with the passage yeah totally different but we got on really well I mean I, the monochrome set again you know got on really well with them yeah. I mean and, and and still to this day I'm still vague I'm still see bid occasionally I still see Dick occasionally you know I mean it was a great and, and of course pillows and prayers that was the big one I mean the album. And the first album was really important, Ratting at the Nation. But the thing that the, the, the two Cherry Red releases, which really, really helped me to maintain the momentum once the music press and everything started to lose interest, which they did because it was this year's thing is last year's thing. That's the way it works. Um, were, uh, first of all, Pillows and Prayers, which is wonderfully eclectic and most important. Well, we should explain that people don't know. That was a compilation of 17 acts signed to Cherry yeah. Red. It sold for 99p. Or the equivalent in local currency. Vinyl or, or cassette. Yeah, yeah. And it was great because the artists all agreed to take no royalty. Yeah. So we could get it actually in the shops at 99p. Yeah, the, stri the, the distributor took less of a cut. And it was a great marketing tool because it sold just in the UK 120,000. Yeah. And we licensed it around the world and as I, well. I mean, it really, really, really helped me because so many people said, oh, well, the first thing I heard of yours was, was a bang and a wimpy on uh, Pillows and Prayers. And the other one, of course, uh, was on the sister label, Anagram, was Burning Ambitions, on which I had Russians in the oh, DHSS. Oh, that's right, I put you on there, because that was a double, out, double Russians album. Russians in the DHSS yeah. again. Those two, yeah. those two to this day, I mean, if it, it, it's not, but, but Russians in the DHSS is a bit of a millstone because it is so completely out of date now. Um, although I've got very, very many new versions of the same thing, like Asylum Seeking Daleks, which are basically the same thing, satirising the sort of tabloid presses, sort of xenophobia and all the rest of it. Um, but A Bang and a Wimpy is still regularly performed. And I can still remember standing on Victoria Station, waiting for my friend to arrive from London, going in the Wimpy Bar and that happening. I can still remember that now. Yeah. Um, so, absolutely. Yeah. And the thing about you and the thing about Trey Red is we weren't, because at that time there was a lot, lot of the late labels, that, that real hip labels, they had an image. Mm. And our image was all over the place. Absolutely. In it's the brilliant. same way that your image totally. was all over the place. I loved it. I've got to say, I've never said this to you before, mate. I'm incredibly proud to have been part of that early Cherry Red thing. I'm incredibly proud to have represented one tiny little bit of something that was absolutely huge and so diverse. I mean, the, the miniatures thing, I mean, which obviously you probably know that I've contributed to a modern day version. Yes. That's and a, I've just yeah. reviewed it in the Morning Star. Yeah. I mean, so we, should, we, should, we should put things in context for people. So miniatures, that was uh, when I was very, very friendly with Morgan Fisher. Well, I still am, but he's living in Tokyo and I don't see him so often, obviously. But uh, Morgan had this idea of doing, I think it was 51 one minute tracks and he got all kinds of people some quite some really well known some not known at all and that came out and it was just so different mm, and then there was a volume two and now as you say someone unconnected with Morgan and Trey Red in America is doing a volume three mm. which is brilliant and again that's a snapshot and and it was was it Andy Partridge did his his one minute track was only 15 seconds the history of rock and roll in 15 seconds. seconds. Yeah, yeah. You've really got to think this through, haven't yeah, you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the latest one, I, I did, I, one that I, that I wrote ages ago called Mountaineering in Belgium, which as you could imagine is quite, it's a surreal piece about uh, actually going shopping in, in Flanders. Um, and, um, and it's about 57 seconds and it just summed it all up really, you know. I mean, but those, all that kind of, e the eclecticism, I mean, I've still got many of the records which, uh, which I got in those really early days and the ones I didn't like, I kept for 40 years and then finally, um, a few years ago, they went to the um, they went to the, the vinyl collectors for considerable sums of money because obviously some of the early ones were have now are now really well, you know already yeah. really valuable. But it was no, it was a really good launch pad for me. Yeah, and the interesting thing was the thing is when your album first album came came out, 
it got panned by the critics, didn't it? Because they loved you to start with. In fact, you did some writing for Sounds, and NME, as you said earlier, had you on the front page. And I I wrote for NME. I I wrote for Sounds, Melody Maker, NME, Time Out, and City Limits. So what happened? Why did they turn on you? They turned on me for two reasons. One is mainly because I I, I committed the cardinal sin um, of the early 1980s music, music journalism scene. If you write about it, you're not allowed to do it. Right, that was it. That was the main thing, the, the basic thing. Um, they were all, I, I mean, I don't want to be, I mean, many of them have completely changed now. I mean, some of them, Gavin Martin, big fan of my stuff now, I get well with. I, I mean, it's yes, that was it, basically. A lot of, I mean, and it's a cliche, and I don't want it to sound bitter or anything, but, but a, a lot of them are just frustrated musicians. Of course. And, yeah, and they hated yeah. the fact there was this bloke who was getting sessions on Peel. And I mean, at the time, to be fair, I was I was Bushel's right-hand man at Sounds. I was doing all the Oi stuff, you know, all the rest of it. So, and they hated that because they hated Oi. So it only got, it got really pounded in any of me. Stockbroker built up. I'd rather, Don Watson wrote Brilliant. I used this quote. I used this quote for years on my promotional material. I would rather gnaw through my own arm than listen to this album again. I mean, you can't beat that for a bit of, a bit of PR. But it yeah. sold really well. It got more plays on Peel. And the significant thing, which you probably don't know, which is a little bit out of out of sync, but it also, you managed to, you managed to do a deal, one of your first ever distribution deals abroad, for it because it came out in New Zealand. Yeah. Now, do you remember that? Vaguely, uh, in well, so far as it was, it was very, we, very made a tiny little afterthought for you. But for me, this was huge. No, we 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 would license some other things, and and they, I don't know whether we pushed them or whether they came anyway, to us and said we'd like this. But it came out. What there, happened? Yeah. What, yeah. And what happened as a result? Now, New Zealand is very different um, in terms of the the, the radio system. Because as, as in common with America, Canada, basically all the other English-speaking countries, they have this college radio, right? That album was played to death on college radio so much that I started getting all these letters. You'd, you'd never heard about this before. Started getting all these letters from Kiwis. And no word of a lie, when I went over for the first time in 1991, both national television channels turned up to a filmy arriving at the airport. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and they did a huge feature in, in the New Zealand Herald. Although, to be fair... It was rather put in perspective by the fact that the huge feature was in between a great big feature on an argument between two neighbours about who had to cut down a dangerous tree and about 18 pages of fat sheep prices. But nevertheless, I was and to some degree still am big in New Zealand. I've toured it three times now yeah. and I've sold out. I mean, I've sold my Auckland gig out, you know, every time I played there. The, the, the first time I played in New Zealand, the Galaxy Theatre in Auckland is to this day, the second best gig I've ever done because there was about at least 500 people there and people broke down the fire exit to get in. Um, and now, you know, it was serious kind of weird pop star status thanks to a few hundred copies and it was that's all it was because because you're very honest and you do proper accounting and I know how many it sold, a few hundred copies that went to New Zealand. Yeah. Talk about a big fish in a little pool. Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> yeah. I think one of my one of my favourite stories in in your book, I'll do a plug for it again, is when you uh, supported John Cale. Oh yeah, because oh, you were a big John Cale, you're a big Velvet oh, fan, God. big John Cale. Huge. I mean, you know, when, when, when I I got my first, because of course when I started out, I was Flavour of the Month, blah blah blah. I got this agent, Nigel Morton, JSC. The first thing he said to me is, now, now John, you know, tell me anyone you'd really like to support. And I went through a few names that like I said, but the one, you know, I'm Boland's dead, so that ain't going to happen. I'm, um, you know, I the Clash. If there's a chance, I never did support the Clash, but you know, lots of other, lots of other punk bands, yeah, obviously. And there was a few others I can't remember, but I said the one I would really love to support, my absolute musical hero, is John Cale, um, and he got me a gig um, supporting John Cale at the venue in Victoria in ni- 1983, March, April. No, no, would have been it would have been later. It would probably be June, July '83, uh, and basically to cut long story short, I went down brilliantly in front of John Cale's audience and some of mine because some people come to see me because I had my second pill session out by then. And John Cale absolutely hated it. And in common so he with, watched you from the side, did he? In common with many, yeah, in common with many performers. I've never got this. I've never understood this. He hated, he obviously hated anybody. I don't think it was me specifically. He hated a support act that went down really well. 
And that's something that is, I've learned is really common. It's the reason, to be frank, that I've, less, I've had less illustrious supports than one might have expected over the years because I have gone down often really well. Support. I've never supported Billy Bragg with Billy Bragg's sort of, um, you know, but Billy Bragg has never invited me to support him. But he and used to support you, Billy Bragg. Uh, yeah, Billy he? Bragg, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there's one example. There's millions of a new model army you've never asked me to support. There's anyway, loads of loads. Let's finish the John story. Basically, what happened was, what happened was, um, the, um, uh, the, you know, I, I, I did the set, came off, you know, really happy, did an encore, did an encore, um, came off really happy. Then a bouncer came in and said, um, John Cale would like to speak to you. And I was thinking, oh, this is fantastic. He wants to see my set. He must be going to say, tell me how, 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 how great it was because I'd gone down really well. I came in and he was, he was obviously in a bit of a stakes because it was that period of the age, shall we say, when he, you know, um, he wasn't always all there, shall we say. And he started ranting at me, you can't sing your, what's this politics, you know, what are you doing at my gig, what are you doing, you know, what the, who the fuck asked you to play? And I said, hang on a minute, mate, I specifically asked to support you because you're one of my all-time musical heroes and influences. Your vi viola style massively inspired the way that I play the violin. Your songs are, and he's just quite, I don't interested in that, you know, what the fuck, you know, and he started, he ranting some more, and I just flipped because at that time, 1983, I was getting seriously targeted by the far right. And I had just, not that long before, I had a massive fight at a place called Skunks in, in Islington where my mandolin was smashed over my head and I was hospitalised. And frankly, I was not going to, at that period, I didn't take any prisoners. And I, so I gave it to him back. I said, look, you know, I said, you know, you don't have to behave like an arsehole. I love your stuff. Stop, you don't, you think you're going to intimidate me? You know, you big, tough Welshman, whatever, you know. Um, and I just, so I just sort of spat back at him. And the next thing, the bouncer was there and I got thrown out of the gig into the street, right? So th I did a great gig got thrown out into the street uh, on John Cale's command. Um, the bouncer thought it was really funny. So, of course, I was then taken around the front, let back in because my mandola was still in the dressing room. Watched John Cale set. Absolutely loved it. Didn't change one iota my attitude to him. Still, I didn't think he, I thought he was an arsehole. But then I was suspected that might be the case. Always loved his music and suspected also that it might have had to do with other, should we say, other things than just him being John Cale. So sure enough, in 2000, when his, when his autobiography came out, What's Welsh for Zen, I queued up in Brighton for the, for the signing and I just said, it's a matter of interest, mate, you know. Um, do you remember a gig in 1983 at the venue in Victoria where you, you, uh, didn't, you didn't like your support out very much? It was me. And he went, he just looked at me, he said, I don't remember anything about the 1990s, mate. <laughs> and that was that. I still love him. Absolute genius. Total respect. Seen him many times since. I mean, and I don't think he's an arsehole, really. I just think at the time he, he was taking too much of the sort of stuff he shouldn't take. Yeah, who knows what else And, and, going, and yeah. the other thing is, I, I've never understood this, you know, because that is something that you get with a lot of performers. They don't like their, their support act or going down well. Now, what, for me, it's wonderful because if I've got someone supporting me who goes down well, it means the audience have had an extra, an extra bit of really good enjoyment in the evening. And yeah. that's the most natural thing in the world. Yeah. But anyway, big up to John Cale. Still, yeah. still an absolute hero. Totally. Yeah. So, as you, as you mentioned there, earlier, the, the political side came out not only in, in your poems, but obviously you, you are a political activist. Yes, I was. I'm a, I was and, you, and, you, and you mentioned Red Saunders. And I, I, I watched a documentary a few months ago on no, one of the Sky nice. Channels, I think, which was all about Rock Against Racism. Brilliant documentary. Which he, he featured heavily. Oh, yeah, brilliant documentary. Yeah. I was, I was there at the time. I was one of the early... I wasn't obviously in the early London scene, but I was at university. I was one of the people that wrote in, you know, um, we, we want to start a... Uh, who do we get in touch with? We want to start Kent... We want to start a Rock Against Racism at Kent University. I just got a, letter, a little note back saying, you are now Kent, Kent Area Rock Against Racism. You know, that was it. So I organised Kent Area Rock Against Racism, which meant, for, as far as I was concerned, because it was all about involving, you know, people... It wasn't just about being students. So we went around the town, we got all the local bands, the investors, infested, the provokers... Longport Buzz, um, put on loads of local gigs in the school, school kids against the Nazis, did all stuff. Uh, had some confrontations with the far right, obviously. It's interestingly, one of the one of the infested or one of the provokers ended up being midfield general, uh, Skints, you know, midfield general. Um, and of course, Skints sponsored the Albion in, 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 uh, in the 90s, another story, or two, early 2000s. So, yeah, I mean, it was it was all kind of, it all fitted together for me. And the, uh, you know, and, and that whole kind of development, because obviously by the mid 1980s, the music press wasn't interested in me at all anymore. I was getting a few plays on Peel, but the mainstream sort of interest had gone. And of course, you know, and, and the, the, it was expected, it was almost expected that, you know, you're like, you're like give up, you know. So and I, I've got a really good, I've, always, I've got a very good kind of way of describing how ridiculous that is. Because when I started off, I was told very, very quickly, you know, you're the best thing since sliced bread. This is brilliant. And I wasn't very good. 
once I started to get good, I was told that was shit. So in that, and I always say that it's like having been the bit, being a, a young apprentice carpenter and being put on the front of the trade magazine as the best carpenter the world has ever seen while you were still doing your apprenticeship. When you were actually really good at putting up shelves and, and stuff and, 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 you know, building, building outbuildings or whatever, being told you should give up and become a plumber now. It's ridiculous the way the music is, the way that fashion works. But fortunately, I'd learned the DIY. I, was, I started to book my own gigs. Uh, through all the networks that I made, through the minor strike, through whopping, through all the political stuff I did, I mean, and, and through Brighton Over Albion as well, um, organising my gigs around the Brighton fixture list. As you know, I've done that for four years too. Um, more difficult now in the Premier League because you never know where the bloody matches are going to be. But that's another story. Um, so yeah, and, and I just became a DIY performer, and I had labels putting out my like, some of my next lot of later albums. You know, uh, Music Disc put one out, Plastic Head that you got me, you got me that one, put one out. It's down the road. Pro Pro yeah, Plus, yeah. the great Pro Plus, the Half Man Half Biscuits label run by Jeff Davis, put one out. By the by the mid nineties though, I started to do them myself. And, and it worked. Even back then, the, the DIY thing worked. Uh, once C CDs got going, it, and, and, you know, and this was before the internet. And once the internet started, it just opened yeah. up like a flower. I mean, I've now got over 40,000 social media followers. I, all, my, all my sort of m m more minor stuff, my, my individual books of poetry and my, and my CDs, I put out myself and it really yeah. works. Obviously, the, 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 what's up, what I'm so pleased about this collaboration is that for the really big stuff, that, you know, the two, those two are my life's work, the autobiography and the collective works. And I'm so proud for them to come out on Cherry Red because you've got the, the distribution clout to get them, you know, into the places where they need to be. And, and that's really good. Anyway, I want to talk about East Germany because you were one of the first, probably the first punk to go out to East Germany. Myself. It wasn't easy. How did that all come about? Did you get um, invited? Well, no, what happened was, what happened, simply this, initially, um, some people came to see, some people from, there was a, a lot of debate in the mid-1980s in the East German Communist Party in the youth section about whether punk rock was politic, was, was progressive or reactionary, basically, and the its progressive side argument won. Um, so basically somebody, I think it was Uschi Klein or somebody saw, anyway, saw Billy Bragg, invited Billy Bragg to come to East Germany to perform at the political song, to perform at the the Summer Song Festival of the Free German Youth, which was the Communist Youth Organization. And I think the Communards or somebody was supposed to go with him, but they pulled out. So he invited the New Town Erotics and me. Well, he invited the New Town Erotics and he got me because Steve Drew is my best mate. I did all the organizing for them. I, I had pr prototype A-level German so I could do, do the translating. And uh, so myself, Billy Bragg and the Neurotics went to East Germany the first time in 86. And then it was fantastic. Got invited back four times before the war came down, this time without Billy Bragg and sometimes without the Newtown Neurotics. I went back, I mean, I think in total, I went back six times before the war came down. I uh, had the most fantastic time, turned my rusty A-level German into something approaching fluency. Well, fluency, I suppose you might say, because yeah. of course they, they, they didn't speak... Um, English as their second language because of the geo geopolitical situation. The, the language they learned as their second language was Russian. So, um, so basically, I had to speak German in order to understand so to learn what was going on in that country. Yeah, but you, but you, but you, you were ranting in English. And they didn't speak English. No, I, I was. What I did over there was my songs. See, that's you did the songs, that's, that's, yeah. the, that's the other side of what I yeah. do, which which we've neglected so far. I mean, I've done you know I've done what ten albums of songs. My German improved vastly. I was doing my songs. I, I, I got a friend of mine, Jörg Volter, and his partner, Ilona Wildebrand, to translate um, a couple of my songs into German so I could sing them in German. Um, yeah. You know, okay. properly, properly formed, because she was a songwriter. She, he was a translator, she was a songwriter. So they, it all fitted together. And, it, and I became really quite well known in the GDR. Um, and, and it was an inspirational time for me. And I'll say to this day, there were many, many, if I look at it now from the perspective of now, I'd say probably 65% of what I saw there was really good, but 35% was really awful. Um, and if you look back on it now, in many of the in many of the areas um, that I went to, a, a, a majority or a very large minority actually say things were better before the war came down than they are now. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's interesting because one thing you mentioned in the, in the book that you went into a hotel lobby in Dresden, and they were playing Bruce Springsteen. Uh, born in the USA, and uh, yeah. so they've got, obviously there were 
influenced by Western music. Yeah, well, oh, absolutely. There was a lot of Western music there. I mean, we Bruce Springsteen actually did a gig in. We, we there's a photo of us backstage at it. Did a gig for the East German Communist Party before the war came down. Yeah. I mean, there was no, there was huge amounts of Western music there. I mean, you know, but but listened to, but very few actual people went over there to perform. I mean, people saying to me, "Oh, you're going to get locked up by the Stasi." I knew who the Stasi guy was. His nickname was Whiskey. He wore Hawaiian shirts. Yes. I mean, they were they, they were just you know they were they were fairly obvious really. And there was a lot of repression, but there was an awful lot of equality, an awful lot of really cheap beer. Uh, people played chess in you know outside cafes instead of gulping down soap operas or whatever. Working class culture was was kind of really just inspirational. They they, they said, you know they had concerts in factories at lunch times. You know classical concerts and, and yeah. jazz concerts whatever, in factories during the lunch breaks. I mean it was just it was really really interesting. Um, and many aspects of it, I quote now as an example of the kind of things that I'd like to see in, you know, anywhere, in, in any country in the world. Yeah. No, I only went, I only went once to uh, East Berlin and what I did notice, you, you, you went that time you went to the underground. Yeah, yeah. To East Berlin from West Berlin. And it was just, it was such a different feeling in so many ways when you got into the East and you went in the shops and the, there's a, so many things that were in the shops in the West weren't in the East. Yeah. And the thing that I remember most, which I think you touch on in the book, is that you get you change some money, you get all this all this money, and uh, I think it's still called Deutsch, still called Deutsch marks then, but he's it was general, DDR marks, yeah, so yeah, GDR marks, yeah. yeah. And it's hard to spend the money. You go in the shops, and what do you actually want to buy? It's uh, in those days, obviously. Well, we were told a part of the deal that we got was basically we were told we will just about be able to cover your expenses in Western money. It wasn't actually enough to cover. This is bearing in mind the neurotics are pretty poor, um, you know. Um, but when you get there, you'll get loads and loads of East German money. So basically, we got the equivalent of about three grand each to spend in a week in GDR yeah. money. What I did with mine, I mean, I, I literally went to the violin shop and I tried out every single violin and I bought a beautiful 1830s um, Czech violin for nearly all of my money and I play it to this day. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, but yeah, if you, I mean, Colin, the New York space player, God rest his soul. I remember he spent a lot of his money just going on a taxi ride round, round, <laughs> round Berlin, right, right yeah. round East Berlin. I mean, you know, no, but it was a really fascinating time. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. and then for, I mean, the other places I went to after that, I went, I went to Albania. Well, exactly. I, I was going to ask you how did that whole Albania thing come about? Because you, when I first met you, you talked about Albania. Yeah, I know. I mean, well, that was uh, Radio Tirana. Radio Tirana interfered with, with Radio 1 on 247 metres when listening to John P. Or did, da, 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 in the background. I don't really remember that. Anyway, but anyway, so I, I got interested. No. I got so, in, so what they did was they tuned into the same wavelength. As it, was, it was accidental, but there was another wavelength, which was, and then you'd, you'd hear it sort of, you know, uh, today we're the, the working people of the district, no, uh, and now we play the most popular song in Albania today. It is called My Homeland. It's the whole of Albania with all of the changes made since liberation. And it is performed by the amateur artistic ensemble of the Envacha Tractor Factory and Municipal Tire Plant in Tirana. And that, of course, that just absolutely completely cracked me up. So I started doing all this ridiculously surreal Albanian stuff. I got to Albania because it was uh, when Saturday comes football fanzine organised a trip there when England played Albania for the first time yes. in the qualifiers in 1989. The match is away, and that means England fans thinking of going along to support their team will have to get a short haircut and clean-shaven image to get into the country. But it seems Albania's strict rules haven't put everyone off. Trying to get into Albania is proving a more difficult exercise than getting tickets for the World Cup final itself. But one group of English fans are determined to succeed where thousands of others have failed. It seems the Tirana authorities have a soft spot for the organisers of the alternative football magazine when Saturday comes. It uh, suddenly struck us in a flash of, uh, of socialist vision that, um, that Albania was the place to go. First to sign up, the bard of Harlow Newtown, Attila the stockbroker. I've been very interested in Albania for a long time, I mean since I was about 14 when I started tuning into Radio Tirana, which is a, a thoroughly surreal radio station, I can assure you it makes it sort of th th even more surreal than Radio 1. But the great nephew of King Zog, the last monarch of Albania, warns of problems ahead. The Albanian language is a mixture of Turkish and Greek. It is almost entirely unique. 
So there's no way they're going to be able to communicate in any way, and certainly no one, very few people in Albania will speak English. Just to ensure they don't offend their hosts, the barber was called in today to remove the fans' beards. Never a welcome sight in the streets of Tirana. If all else fails, music will become the link. We're off to Tirana, a viva Albania. We're going by coach, it's not that far. A viva Albania. If you want to see a massive great statue of Comrade Ember. I got invited to tour North Korea um, as part of the World Festival of Youth and Students from people that came to the GDR. I couldn't go because I was already touring Canada, but my mate Steve Drew went there and had a really strange time there. Um, yeah, I performed, I performed in 24 countries all over the world. Six tours of Canada, four tours of Australia, three New Zealand, six of the US, yeah. all over mainland Europe. Obviously totally knackered by Brexit now. Um, but yeah, I mean, part of the, one of the most fundamental sort of, if you think, in terms of an interview like this, one of the most fundamental things to say is that, that uh, up until recently, it is changing a bit now as I'm getting older, I regarded my operation as completely global. And it's certainly fair to say that through the 80s and 90s, I was as well known in Australia, well known or not well known, if you like, in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and um, Germany, Aus Austria, Switzerland, Holland, as I am in the UK. I mean, it was always yeah. a kind of, because I'm a very internationalist perspective. I love foreign languages. I speak French and German. It was always a kind of, that was always a kind of an important thing for me. Yeah. And another highlight for me of the book was when you, you were the substitute for Donny Osmond, Osmond at the Marquee. So talk us through that. So Donny Osmond was going to headline the Marquee. He pulls out and then someone said, I tell the brother, Stone Poker can do it. Well, a what, perfect what, mix for the audience. Yeah, I know. What, what happened was this. It is, it is really funny. I can still remember the poster. There was a, it was when he was just, he just started, sort of was making a comeback. And there was this poster of him wearing this ridiculously fake studied leather jacket. And the idea was that Donnie was going to play smaller venues to connect with a different audience or, so, or something. Anyway, there was, I think it was at the time of the, of the 1991 Gulf War, and there was a lot of sort of terrorism, you know, scares or whatever. So he was too scared to fly. And this was at two days notice or something. And so the, and the marquee wanted to stay open. What the guy who was booking the marquee at the time was someone who was familiar with me and with my great friend TV Smith, who I'm, who's, you know, ex-adverts now, a wonderful, no, singer, no, yeah, wonderful yeah. singer, songwriter, solo singer, songwriter, um, who actually I persuaded to take up playing acoustic guitar and singing. Uh, which has been hugely successful for him. Anyway, to cut a long story short, uh, next thing we know, we get a call. Would you and TV Smith like to support Donny Osmond? Sorry, like to fill in for Donny Osmond. Um, so there I was, on a Monday night, I think it was at the Marquee, um, doing this, you know, basically the deal was, was people, obviously they didn't, because it was such short notice, most people, and you couldn't, there was no internet then. So most people turned up, they didn't know that, um, that it wasn't going to happen. So they turned up, cancelled. However, you can come in for nothing and watch it till the stockbroker and TV Smith. I think, sure, it was TV Smith. Anyway, half of them went home, of course. The other half, because they were there, they did. And of the half that went in, probably at least 50% really enjoyed it. And I got an encore. Yeah. Um, and my encore was Puppy Love, which I learned on the mandolin. Especially, and to this day, I do that story, and I can do a nice little version of Puppy Love to this day. Yeah. Um, and it was that. That was. I mean, I have. I have had some ridiculously strange experiences in terms of the kind. Because, because of course, when you're when you're a solo, when you're a performance poet, and it's just you and a mandolin or whatever, you're completely versatile. So you can be called in to do something at the very last minute. And I'm. I mean, I'm. I've never been somebody who wants to preach the converging. I've always loved taking what I do to places where, I mean, in terms of my poetry, a lot of the time I'm taking poetry to the kind of environments where people don't normally listen to poetry. And I also like to take Attila the Stockbroker sometimes to the kind of environments where people wouldn't normally listen to Attila the Stockbroker. I've supported Saxon, for God's sake. I went down really well there as well. You know, I mean, I've had a couple. I don't ever really go down badly except when there are fascists around but because I'm loud and confident and I can hold my own and at the very l lowest common denominator I've got a lot of poems with knob gags and stuff in so I can normally get by but yeah I mean that that was a, that was wonderful that was just a, just one of those funny things that happens in life you know it was, it was yeah. great it was great and I know you mentioned TV Smith who's another 
I think, very talented lyricist and, and uh, musician as well. And you also you've worked with uh, Otway quite a bit. Haven't oh you? yeah, John absolutely. Otway. Me and Otway, we wrote another, a rock another opera. real independent character. We wrote a rock opera together, Cheryl. Cheryl, a rock opera, an everyday story of Satanism, transporting drug abuse, and unrequited love. Played it at the did it at the Edinburgh Festival. Got five star reviews. Toured it around the country. Yeah. Tim and I do loads of gigs together. I play the fiddle with him. Actually, my very first gig in a year and a half. Well, year, it was a year and year and a quarter uh, is coming up at the end of this month. Really looking forward to it. And that's me and Tim in, in Ashburton, near where he lives now. He's back in Devon now, at Ashburton Arts Centre. It's my first gig since his lockdown. You know, um, yeah. I mean, I'm privileged to know an awful lot of of great talented people and you know we work together so yeah it's, but it's, it's the it's the free spirits that we talked absolutely. about earlier that you're drawn to absolutely to work yeah. with that's um, i mean you know i am i feel myself to be like that and since the internet i mean one of the things i mean when when we were confronted with covid i mean one of the first things that i did was um i sat there and i made myself learn the technology to broadcast live i'm not a techie person at all yeah. i sat there and i made i got some help and i and i and because i knew that with the following i had because i do a lot of writing on, on Facebook and uh, to a lesser degree on Twitter. Um, and I knew that with the, with the following I had, I could reach a lot of people. And, and I've been broadcasting regularly for the last year, ironically reaching more people, many more people, than I would do normally doing live gigs around the country. Yeah. Um, and, and that has worked really well too. Yeah. So, okay, we've got a, we got a few minutes left. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about football? because you're a big Brighton and Hove Albion fan. They've had a pretty rough time. And Absolutely. you actually, I think you were the, the PA announcer for 14 years, weren't you? So I was. Yeah. I mean, well, basically, I mean, obviously, I've been a Brighton fan all my life. For most of my life, or the early part of my life, it was kind of the, it was the relaxing. It was the hobby. It was the, what you did in between everything else. So yeah. I followed Brighton home and away through all the leagues. And then in the mid-90s, um, things started to completely collapse. Our ground, uh, basically... An arsehole called Bill Archer got control of the of the club for fifty six pounds and twenty five pence. Sold the ground behind our backs. Um, we were made homeless. I unilaterally declared Brighton Independent Supporters Association. We got together as a kind of as a collective, organised loads and loads of, of demonstrations, um, and got Archer out. Um, but Dick Knight came in to save the club, and um, we went up. Gradually through the leagues, and we had to spend two years playing at Gillingham after our game was yeah, sold. I remember, yeah. At that point, I became the PA announcer. I said to Dick, "You know, we need a friendly voice from home here, yeah? someone who plays some nice punk rock and ska and stuff." Yeah. Um, so for two years at Gillingham, and then for the next twelve years at Withdean, where we moved to, I was the PA announcer, also poet in residence. I've written loads of poems about the album. There's loads in there. The two two of them in there, Golds and Ghosts and Knighthood, are hang on our supporters' bar in the new stadium where we moved to in 2011. Obviously, it's called Falmer. I, I've never had a credit card. As far as I, we we had a hit in 2004 that I that I put together a little, nice little scam that was. Uh, just after Christmas, when no one else buys records, new version of the Piranhas, Tom Hart, Tom Hart, we want Falmer. Got to number 17 in the charts. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I've always, so, and not only have I always been a Brighton fan and part of this kind of radical football faction, but I've also always, but we as Brighton fans have always done our best to help other clubs in a similar situation, as indeed we did with AFC Wimbledon, yeah. you're a supporter you of. You came to see us play um, in the early yeah, days, didn't absolutely. you? Yeah, absolutely. When, when, yeah. when uh, cause we've all, you know, when, when what happened to you happened, we absolutely understood it, how contemptible it was. And we well, rallied around, did everything we could. Uh, and we have done for many other clubs as well. Yeah. And uh, you know this whole that this whole new development of fan-owned clubs is, especially at the lower levels, is absolutely brilliant. I mean, we've just we've actually just rescued. I'm the second time in my life that I've rescued my local club. I mean, this time it's the tiny little local county league club, Southwick FC, torn apart by basically a council who didn't care and a leaseholder who wanted to use it as a drinking den, for ground fell to bits, <coughs> and uh, now we've we've reclaimed it and we started the club again. Um, and, and I'm for the first time in my life, I'm on the board of directors of something, which is Southwick 1882 FC. Yeah. I might ask AFC Wimbledon for a friendly to raise a bit of money. You never know. OK, so towards the end of the book, you say you're angrier than ever at the state of the world. Yeah. Is that still the case? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There's even more to be angry about now than when I started. I mean, the, the, the increase in, 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 in incredible... Um, gap between the, the very wealthy and the very poor, the, the ridiculous waste of resources, the rape of the planet, the sadly the increasing racism that we see in our society now, the xenophobia, Brexit, the rise of people like Trump. There's there's even more to be angry about. But the but the other side, which we haven't really uh, uh, touched on, that we should touch on a bit um, 
Ian, is, is the very personal side of what I do. Because on a personal level, my mother died of, of Alzheimer's after a six-year battle. Yeah. I wrote a poem about that, which actually is probably the most broadcast poem I've ever done. It's 14 minutes long. Um, and it's been you know, it's been on Radio 4 at least three times. Um, and on lots of local radio stations too. I've had cancer. Uh, I got bladder cancer in 2015. I wrote about that. I wrote about the necessity for blokes, especially blokes of our kind of age, to go to the doctor when you've got something wrong down there. Yeah, but people prostate, getting, yeah. People getting, yeah. It wasn't prostate, it was, okay. it was the bladder. Yeah. I've had lots of flexible cystoscopies. I wrote a poem about that. I should do that poem for you now, actually. Go on. I know that I can sometimes be a loudmouth, stroppy prat. I know I'm a control freak and a bossy one at that. My wife says when I'm eating, I am a total slob. I'm still not sure that I deserved a camera up my knob. The poor thing shriveled up in fear till it was hardly there, a tiny little pimple in a nest of pubic hair. The camera made its entrance, the pain cut like a knife, and then I saw my bladder for the first time in my life. I'm glad that it went up there, though, sad of what it found, but it can come back any time to help me stay around. So three cheers for the NHS and for that camera crew. And if you're feeling odd down there, you get it checked out too. <laughs> you see, that's, and yeah, lots and lots of very personal poetry about my, about my father's death, about my mother's Alzheimer's, about early family. Um, the, the first part of the new book, of the anthology, is all my early years. It's all the, 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 the your people might pick it up and be surprised when they see initially I don't see lots of angry, ranting, political poetry. There's all that at the beginning, although a lot of that is political too in its own way. But it's all in there. In that book, it's all in there. All the different aspects of what I'd always say that, that you know, all human... I, I, I don't see myself as a, as a serious poet or as a comic poet or as a comedian or as a, a serious commentator. I think life is, all, is, a, is life is sadness, happiness, anger, frustration. All human, I, all human life is in my work. And again, that goes against some of the received wisdoms, which is you're supposed to either be, um, you know, a very serious, angry, political performer or someone who does knob gags. I do both. Yeah. Quite happily. Can you remember most of the poems in the, in the book? 80%. Isn't I find that amazing? it, I find it incredibly easy to remember... Um, over rhyming, 300 pages. Rhyming cutlets, couplets. I find it more difficult to remember blank verse. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, the and, and obviously lockdown had a huge effect as well. I'd like to do I'd, I'd like to do this poem. I, I, I mean, you know, this is the poem I wrote during lockdown for my wife, Rabina, um, who has just become the first ever Labour councillor for Southwick Green on a 20 percent swing. <laughs> and a difficult um, time. And a difficult time. Yeah. So this is called to my wife, Rabina. On the occasion of my 40th anniversary, which was last year, um, September the 10th last year was the, September the 8th last year was the 40th anniversary of my first gig as a, as a tiller. As you will know, September the 10th, I was supposed to be doing a big gig at Dingwalls to launch the anthology. And of course, we all know what happened next. Anyway, I wrote this poem. For 40 years today, I've lived this life, travelled the world for concerts far and wide. For half that time, my life, you've been my wife, a glorious inspiration at my side. A quarter of the year or more apart. For me, a time to rant, for you to rest. Then I return to you, my loving heart. Resume our path together, to abreast. When lockdown hit, at first I was bereft, though I believed it should have come before. My travelling ways through all the years were done. The gigs I built my life around, no more. I thought, then wrote, then learned to broadcast live. Though IT still remains a fickle friend. My office now the gateway to my world. A world I first thought would come to an end. But now we were together all the time. Strong characters faced with a brand new test. My table manners and the toothpaste top. This tireless tongue which never seems to rest. But all our days were filled with love and fun. We never thought... Something will have to give. We looked into each other's eyes and said, no one I'd rather be in lockdown with. I loved to watch our garden as it grew. Not sometimes this year, every single day. Tomatoes from the seed to bright red fruit. Green beans to freezer from the starting tray. 
When lockdown eased a bit and summer came, my childhood days returned, my rods, my bike. A few hours apart, now all we need, a night apart, now something not to like. One day, I hope, I'll hit the road again. One day your peace and quiet will return. But this great revelation in our love, enforced by fate, was wonderful to learn. So darling, thanks for marrying me full time, this stroppy poet, loud of mouth and ass. And as my valediction in this rhyme, I hereby W, comrade wife, first class. Cheers. Thank you. So it's changed, isn't it, in terms of how you are Absolutely. as a person and a poet. And to start with, it was mainly anger. And yeah, now I, you haven't lost your edge. No, not at all. But you have much more heart now, yeah. it seems to me, anyway. I've always had the heart. But at the beginning, I thought it was an expression of weakness. I thought it was, it, people just didn't want to hear about that. And that's because I was 22. Yeah. And at, at 63, I know that, there are, that people go, everyone is going through this stuff yeah. and people absolutely relate to it. And one of the most wonderful things is that I can perform this to people who are, my, who are my, who the age I was when I started off. And I say to them, you know, I hope, you'll do, I hope you'll have as much fun doing this as I have. And I hope that when you get to my age, you'll be able to do the kind of poetry that I do now. Yeah. In other words, not feel that you're somehow, somehow being less or being more compromising or whatever by talking about all the personal stuff. But it's around it, you're a rounded human being. You want to reflect all aspects of your personality. And yeah. that's what I do now. I mean, that book is full of me, both as a, as a, as a husband, as a stepfather, uh, as, a, as a son, um, as a ranting performance poet, as a political activist, and as a football fan, it's all in there, all different sides, and that's what I believe is best that that performance writing should be should be about. Yeah. Well, that's a great place to finish. I tell you, thank, thank you. you I, I, I'll say again, I am honoured to have had such a long association with Cherry Red Records. A big up to everybody who's worked there. Not only have you put out some really interesting stuff, but I will also say, in, in a world where, should we say, not everybody is is honest. And when not everybody actually does things like accounting and actually, you know, pays what's due. I've received a regular accounts from Cherry Red for 40 years from the material that, that you've put out of mine. I really respect that. I doff my cap to you for that. And, and you know, in, in every way, Cherry Red is the kind of record label equivalent of me. Eclectic, always developing, always changing, always looking for new ideas. And at heart, just loving, celebrating doing what you love and earning your living out of it, which is all any human being can, can dream of doing. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, Attila, again. And thank you for watching Cherry Red TV. And I hope we see you again soon. Goodbye. Afternoon all. I'm Attila Stockbroker, performance poet and musician. I've had a 40 year association on and off with Cherry Red Records and indeed Cherry Red Books. And um, I'm very proud and happy to say that they've just published my collected works, Heart on My Sleeve, my collected works of 40 years, following on from the 2015 publication of my autobiography, Arguments Yard. Now this book is quite literally the best of Attila the Stockbroker in terms of my poem lyric, my poem lyrics and my song lyrics. And if you've ever been to an Attila the Stockbroker gig and enjoyed it, the likelihood is that you'll find a piece that you've enjoyed in this book because this goes all the way from my beginnings, stuff like Russians and the DHSS, Contributing Negligence, A Bang and a Wimpy, right up to the most recent poetry that I wrote during lockdown. Um, so I'm going to do two poems for you from this book, both family centred um, and both opposite extremes. My mum had Alzheimer's for six years. I wrote this in frustration at about a certain relative who used to come to help. Uh, help she did not. This is called Poison Pensioner. I've tried to work it out, but I just can't see how a cretin like you is related to me. You've just one brain cell and that one's a mess, parroting rubbish from the Daily Express. Now, not the sun. You'd say that was a rag, delusions of grandeur from a jumped up hag. But don't get ideas. You're as thick as a shoe. Poison Pensioner, this poem's for you. I've had it up to here and I'm cutting up rough. Distant relative? Not distant enough. Ever thought of space travel? Prejudiced cow? I'd suggest Uranus, but you're up there right now. You've a monochrome vision of a world that's dead. A million reader's digests inside your head. I like to put vomit in a cheese fondue. Poison pensioner, 
this poem's for you. You worked all your life in the public sector and all he ever did was whine and hector, moan at the people who fought your cause, cheer for the Tories and their union laws. You were born in a council house, you clueless bitch, but you side with the right and you vote with the rich, bowing and scraping to the privileged few. Poison pensioner? This poem's for you. You've a medal for meddling, that's for sure. If this was my house, then I'd show you the door. But my mum needs help and you're here to see her. So I sit and I listen to your verbal gonorrhea. Right now, I wish I was in her head. Because mum won't remember a word you've said. Your compassionate act just got a bad review. Poison pensioner, this poem's for you. Bossy yet servile. Some combination. Paralysed spine of a lickspit or nation. Could have been a builder. Ended up a tool, lifelong victim of divide and rule. You're a ragged trouser philanthropist who wasn't even waiting for the boat you missed. You're a turkey voting for Christmas too. Poison pensioner, this poem's for you. And from the other extreme, both of my family history and uh, my, if you like, political activism, this poem, which um, I wrote for my stepfather just before he died, and it's called Never Too Late. My father died when I was 10, and when she dried her tears, Mum met you in the choir. She'd known of you for years. I was so pleased when she told me that she would be your wife, and I looked forward happily to a new man in my life. But you were the classical singer who thought rock and roll was junk, and I was the bowling boogie boy who soon became a punk. You were the civil servant for whom everything had its place, and I was the left-wing activist out there and in your face. Yes, you were the head of the household and I was the stroppy kid. We wound each other up for sure. We flipped each other's lid, but later we both learned so much and something new began. And here's a poem I wrote for you, you decent, gentle man. So I went off to my own life, left you and mum to yours. A few words about football, then the sound of closing doors. But the passing of so many years gave us both time to reflect. And slowly, oh so slowly, we forged a new respect. When you were ill the first time and found it hard to walk, I'd take you to the hospital and we would sit and talk. It felt so right and normal. And it was such a shame that it had taken all this time, both stubborn, both to blame. Because you were the head of the household, and I was the stroppy kid. We wound each other up for sure. We flipped each other's lid. But later, we both learned so much and something new began. And here's a poem I wrote for you, you decent, gentle man. When mum came down with Alzheimer's, five years you cooked and cared. And we were around there every day, so many thoughts were shared. Your simple, honest loyalty. The vows you made, you'd keep. No longer the big boss man, no, me, no longer the black sheep. Then came that day in hospital. The end was near, we knew. He told me, I do love you, John. I said, I love you too. You took my hand and squeezed it. Our eyes were filled with tears. The first time that we'd said that, it took 37 years. Because you were the head of the household and I was the stroppy kid. We wound each other up for sure. We flipped each other's lid. But later, we both learned so much and something new began. And here's a poem I wrote for you, you decent gentleman. It's never too late, never too late, never too late to say you love someone. And if it wasn't too late for me and John, then it's never too late for anyone. Heart on my sleeve, that's where I wear it, always have done. 40 Years of the Poems and Song Lyrics of Attila the Stockbroker, out now on Cherry Red Books, available from Cherry Red, from my Bandcamp site, and from self-respecting bookshops worth their salt, online and in person, up and down the country.